hi everyone welcome back to my channel and the last part of the lecture series i apologize it has taken me way too long to get this video up but you know life happens sometimes and your plans get derailed so i'm back now and no more derailments hopefully so let's continue on. Not that anyone's really watching this channel, but it's okay. <laughs> Whoever is watching, I hope this helps you. And I hope that we can instill better self-care practices moving forward in the veterinary profession. That's really my goal. And how can we do that if we don't actually have like standards for self-care or protocols for self-care? Have you ever sat in a job interview and like asked the interviewer, so what are your self-care protocols here at this clinic? No, you probably haven't. That's what we need to start asking because what I'm going to tell you is that the, you have more power than you think you do and that if you're not advocating for yourself don't expect anyone else to so the purpose of these guidelines they're actually guidelines that are utilized by all members of the green cross and it's basically for people in a helping profession helping field unfortunately veterinary medicine does get forgotten about, which is why I'm here trying to be like, hey, you know, we're a helping profession too. We suffer from burnout too, and we need to have guidelines for self-care as well. So first purpose is to do no harm to yourself in the line of duty when helping and treating others to yourself in the line of duty. That means like don't be too tired or too sleep deprived or too impatient to then end up getting bit, for instance. We all know that job injury incidences go up when people are overworked, overtired, sleep deprived. Second, attend to your physical, social, emotional, and spiritual needs as a way of ensuring high quality services to those who look to you for support as a human being. When I go to the emergency room, I am thinking about, hmm, I wonder what this like doctor's self-care is like, or I wonder what this nurse's self-care is like. Did they eat today yet before they're consulting me? Or are they actually starving because they've just been running from one patient to another and their brain is low on glucose and now they're making these decisions on my life or my health? These thoughts literally go through my head, like, but I can't directly be like, so how's your self-care today? Um, just because I know that for the majority of doctors and nurses and people in the medical field, that it's going to be in the toilet. It's not going to be good. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that our systems run. But alas, I digress. Moving on. So there are ethical principles of self-care and practice that, again, no one talks about. Oops, jumped ahead a second there. Uh, so this is really important to have a conversation. If you're looking to do something regarding wellness, maybe you can start implementing ethical principles of self-care. These principles declare that it is unethical not to attend to your self-care as a practitioner because sufficient self-care prevents harming those we serve. We know that sleep deprivation makes decision-making more prone to error, for instance. So number one, respect for the dignity and worth of self. A violation lowers your integrity and trust. So if you don't have good self-worth thoughts, practices, you're probably not good at self-care. So what can you do to increase your worth of self? Well, you know, we covered some of that in the second lecture, but again, important to revisit here. Number two, your responsibility of self-care. Ultimately, it is your responsibility to take care of yourself and no situation or person can justify neglecting it. 
this is so funny because it's not funny, but it's true. And we neglect our self-care all the time to try and show up for people or to try and be, stay the extra hour, extra day, pick up that extra shift. So as a recovering people pleaser, it's been pretty hard for me to say no when people ask for my help, especially because I am a helper. That is just like what I'm programmed to do, where my mind goes. Even like yesterday, it was so cold outside and I was freezing and I had to figure out how to use the stupid damn Costco air tire pressure thingy, which, so it has you scan this thing. It's just a whole thing if you've never used it before. Now, once you've figured it out, it's easy, but it was freezing rain outside. I got to put air in my tires and someone stops like conveniently next to me with their car, with a friend, uh, sitting in the car that can help this person ask for my help because it looks like I know what I'm doing. Multiple times people asked me for help and I was like, do you see the sign here? Scan it. It gives you instructions, but I, it took everything in me to not just like show them how to do it. I had to like hold back because I was like, I am freezing. And if I stop to help this person who can literally just scan and follow these instructions without me doing it for them, or it says, if you can't figure it out, go inside and ask the Costco attendee. They can go and ask the Costco attendee, but I always want to make things better for people. So like I, it felt so hard to say no, so hard. And I had to get in my car and be like, I'm sorry, I can't help you right now. Like, even though I could have sacrificed my self, and this is a very minor example, like would it have really cost me that much to help this person? Probably not. But if I stop to help every single person that asks for my help and then I'm frozen in the rain, my hands frozen, I don't know. That's just where it was coming from. And it was more because I was actively trying to practice, not immediately rushing to help some person who is asking for help. Because sometimes if you just stop and be like, can you figure this out on your own? Because if you learn this on your own, that's actually more empowering for you instead of just being, because that, that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to ask the person who was doing it to do it for me or to run into Costco and be like, hey, I need help. I can't figure this out because I didn't want to put the time in. I just wanted someone to show me and I wanted to be out of there because I was in a hurry. It was freezing rain. So that's a tangent, but really, it's really hard as a helper to say no and a recovering people pleaser to say no. So I'm not saying that you should be saying no to helping people if you're kind of a jerk and never help people, then you probably need to practice your helping muscle skills. You know, this is for people who are already helping all day, every day at the expense of their own well-being. That's what we're talking about here not like giving you carte blanche to be a jerk. So number three is self-care and duty to perform. There must be a recognition that the duty to perform as a helper cannot be fulfilled if there is not at the same time a duty to self-care. And you know what? We're just really bad at asking for help when we need help. So this is from Vet Confessionals. It says, this is the most wonderful, terrible, bright, dreary, chaotic, rewarding, and stressful career. Couldn't be more true. Thank goodness for our amazing community. We are always there to support each other. If you need help, please ask. And on that note, I will be launching a support community group where we will be getting together on a regular basis to support each other and promote self-care practices and make a self-care plan. So stay tuned for that, which will build off of this lecture. And, you know, it's not easy. In our profession, people are so burnt out and bitter and dead inside that sometimes it does feel like there is no one I can talk to 
if or when I make mistakes. And everyone judges everyone. They say they don't, but they do. Not that it happens often, but we all make mistakes. This person who submitted this confession clearly feels like they can't even go to the persons around them for help because it is not easy to ask for help to begin with. And there are people in the profession that are quite judgmental. But I just try and keep in mind that these people are probably burnt out and bitter, honestly, because that's what happens. Like you can uh, still function in the environment that's dysfunctional, but you lose this part of yourself that I don't know. I really truly believe like deep down a lot, the majority of people in our profession are honestly like amazing, good people. That's why we went into this profession to begin with, because we truly wanted to help. And I think that sometimes things go a little awry. So make sure that when you are asking for help that you do truly feel like it's someone that can help you. And that genuinely seems like they are looking out for you because there's a lot more corporations and people who never did animal medicine taking over in our industry that honestly, maybe aren't the best people to talk to. So find the best person or a person who seems like they could be helpful that you can trust because I know it can be hard. This is me and my grandpa. This was when I was much younger <laughs> and still in vet school. And he was the one person who wanted me to get my education and go become a doctor. And so he actually supported me the most. And I try and remember that when, you know, when I think of him. But the other day, I mean, I think of him all the time. I literally had a dream of him last night where I told him that I didn't want to live in a world without him because he was like my hero and like the reason why I became a doctor, honestly. He was a doctor and this confession I have posted next to our photo was someone who just reminded me of what it was like. And it says, the one person who wanted me to become a veterinarian died before he could see me graduate. I am sad because he can't ride with me on farm calls. For a lawyer's son, I become a fantastic food animal vet. Graduation was anticlimactic because you weren't there. Thanks for believing in me. Love be rest in peace, PCL, 1949 to 2007. And my grandfather also died before I was a before he was able to see me graduate. And the reason I post this picture is because if you look at the photo, there's alcohol, there's cigarettes, and there's cash money. <laughs> I'm joking. But that is what and this photo is in Wisconsin where I kind of grew up, where my grandpa was a doctor and he was a human OBGYN delivered babies. He even specialized in female reproductive oncology as well. Owned his own practice. Everything was like a huge staple, like hero in the community. I went to high school with kids who would like tell me that my grandpa delivered them, which I always thought was so cool. And I realized when I was in therapy the other day, my therapist brought up that like how burnt, how my grandpa probably had a lot of stress from his job, which is why he drank a lot and smoked a lot. <laughs> and um, he still lived to 83, which is like shocking and never actually got lung cancer, but did eventually pass away due to the repercussions of his poor self-care. And honestly, sometimes I still think he would be here if he had better self-care and that like he would still be in my life. 
So that's why I implore you, like, even if it isn't for yourself, even if you can't find the self-worth to do it for yourself, do it for someone you love and realize that, like, they want you around. Even if it's your dog or your cat, they need you. They need you around. You need to do better, be better for them. So moving on from that, our standards of humane practice of self-care is that this is just humane practice of self-care standards, okay, that no one talks about. Again, one is the universal right to wellness. Every helper, regardless of her role or his role or their role or employer, has a right to wellness associated with self-care. Two, physical rest and nourishment. Every helper deserves restful sleep and physical separation from work that sustains them in their work role. That is why I do relief because I have not been able to get relief or locuming, whichever country you're listening from, but I basically work like full-time hours and then I take a month off. And then I work full-time hours again, and then I might, it does vary, but that's just like a generic example of kind of how I work. And that's mainly because that's associated with self-care. It's so I can make a sustainable career because I literally have never worked for a company that does that or allows that. So the only way I was able to find it was by doing relief, which makes it difficult sometimes to, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people don't want to locum. And one of them is because you don't have the steady income. So, but we'll get into that another day, how I manage that. Um, so three is emotional rest and nourishment. This is so important, you guys. Emotional rest. Like, can we please just stop a second and acknowledge that people have long ago talked about emotional rest and our jobs on the front lines, on the clinic floor are extremely emotionally taxing. Does that mean you shouldn't do it? No, it just means that you need emotional rest and emotional nourishment. So you need emotional and spiritual renewal both in and outside of the work context. Four, sustenance modulation. Every helper must utilize self-restraint with regard to what and how much they consume, food, drink, drugs, stimulation, since it can compromise their competence as a helper. Like, how many times have you gone home from a shift just utterly trashed emotionally and you can't sleep because your nervous system is all frazzled, which makes you think like you would be able to sleep, but that I talk about as well in my second lecture a little bit. But basically, then you might have a drink or a smoke or something to help you sleep. And then the next day, you got to go back to work and you're already kind of compromised because you might be a little hungover. You might be a little bit slower. So basically, it's difficult. It's difficult to have sustenance modulation and Oh my gosh, or even all the sugar that we eat at work because it's what gets us through the shift. Like me and my sister talk about it because she's a human nurse in New York City and like how like bad my diet gets, no matter like how hard I try to eat good. If someone's dropping off a bunch of cookies or donuts or pizza, I'm going to eat it because it gets me through the shift. It gives me that extra bit of energy I need when I'm going on hour 10 or 11 or 12. So, and day four or five, especially. I'm better at modulating if I'm working less hours, less days. But, you know, it just goes out the window as soon as something super delicious rolls in (laughs) as a treat. So, it's difficult. And the only way I find that I can actually truly modify and not eat so many bad stuff is if I don't 
put myself in that environment as much and I give myself rest. So there's also standards of expecting appreciation and compensation. One is seek, find, and remember appreciation from supervisors and clients. These are, and other activities increase worker satisfaction, sustain you emotionally and spiritually. I did talk about the negativity bias in a previous lecture, and it is hard to focus on the positive sometimes because our brains tend towards a negativity bias. So it's important to remember that you need to seek, find, and remember appreciation. And, you know, Abraham Lincoln, he had a folder, an appreciation folder that he would review whenever he felt down. So that's one example. Because it would remind him of all the good things he did. Because it's not easy being the president of the United States, I'm sure. Um, so that's just one example. Make it known that you wish to be recognized for your service, that recognition is important to you. I mean, this one is a bit silly because I just feel like ugh, employers need to be better at recognizing and recognizing by giving us raises, by actually paying us what we're worth. I have ugh, emphasized this so many times, but yet it falls on deaf ears. There's only so many socks you can buy someone or pizzas before they're just like, okay, like you need to give me a raise now. I've been with you for five years and I've gotten like $2.50 raise. Seriously. And if you are a manager or an owner listening to this, honestly, get your shit together, please. And do the right thing by your people. Because that's how you're going to actually retain and show people they are recognized. Okay. Cash money. So not that we don't appreciate the free food, honestly. That's like a bare minimum. Especially if we're working on a holiday or we're staying late to go to a CE lecture. That is a mandatory one and you don't even get food. No. No. Oh, don't even get me started, honestly, on how angry some of this stuff makes me. So moving on, select one or more advocates. These are colleagues who know you as a person and as a helper and are committed to monitoring your efforts at self-care. Make a formal, tangible commitment to self-care. Written, public, specific, and measurable promise to self-care. Set deadlines and goals. The self-care plan should be connected to specific activities. And generate strategies that work. This can take a while to generate a strategy that works for you, and it could always change. You don't just set a strategy and it works now and you expect that it's going to work forever. No, that's not how it is because things change. Life changes. Jobs change. So we'll set up a self-care plan and we'll talk about that more. If you want to join our self-care plan group. But if not, this is a great thing to follow to set up your own on your own and just know it doesn't make you weak it's not a flaw to have self-care practices in place it's a strength and there's stigma around it oops go ahead around seeking help there's still <laughs> it's so funny because like when I first started locoming and doing relief work people would tell me that like I didn't really work like, because I would take a lot of time off and I would spend so much time just getting so frustrated because I'd be like, I don't know how else to work. Like these people are saying, these people mostly are not in my life anymore just because they 
needed to be cut out because <laughs> um, it's toxic, honestly. If someone's giving you crap and you know you're working as best as you can, that person's toxic. That, hands down. Unless you hired them like they're your personal trainer who's supposed to give you shit because you want to do better and be better or something like that. That's different. I'm talking about how people are so conditioned to think that if you don't work a regular job or work 40 hours, I was working more than 40 hours a week sometimes, that you're not working at all, <laughs> which just makes no sense. But it was hard. It was hard. Now relief and locoming is a little bit more accepted. Uh, but it's still hard because people still like kind of treat you like you're not one of us. Like, and it's like, there's this weird, but it's all because of self care. Like, honestly, it's not because because I literally will die if I don't take care of myself um, and there's no one else to do that for me. So I have to watch out for myself and I want to stay in this profession and make it sustainable. So that's where I'm at. Okay, moving on. How do you set up a self-care plan when you don't know where to start? Well, first you got to make some goals. Because a dream without a plan is just a wish. That's what they say anyway. So you can keep wishing all day, every day, but nothing's going to change if you don't have some goals set up that are actually smart. So not just being like, I want to work out more or... I want to eat better. It's like, yeah, but how are you going to do that? How are you going to get there? So here is an example of a poor smart goal. I will exercise regularly. Example of a good smart goal is I will build my physical strength by working out at the gym with my accountability partner for 30 minutes, three times a week for 30 days starting Monday. That is specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time-based. So just go ahead and start with yourself. Don't try and change others. Start your own plan. And if you're not sure where to start, stay tuned because we'll definitely be giving you more information about how to jump on the struggle bus and keep going. Thanks for listening.